I, I know for a fact that you've had a very tough day. Has it been good here in Sweden, you think? It's been a great day in Sweden. Has it? Have you achieved uh, what you had set to do? Well, I don't think you ever know until you know you go home and, and if sometimes a few months or a year later, but, but we'll see. I certainly hope so. That's right. And we know that you're off to uh, another country later today, I think Germany, and also to continue this and really try to get action. I should also say, SCI has benefited from support from your foundation in various areas, health, water, sanitation not least, uh, but also in terms of agriculture, food security. And we know, just like SIDA, that there are certain triggers, issues that you're pushing very hard for. And I, we appreciate that very much. You're challenging us as well. Please, the floor is yours for a presentation. Um, and we will see afterwards if there is any time for any question, but please. Great, thank you, Johan. Thanks for having me. Can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, so I love coming to Sweden, uh, not just on days as glorious as today, but really any time. And this is my first uh, chance back in Sweden here in 2015, but it's really this unbelievable shared partnership that we have on so many issues such as global health and development, uh, where we have very, very aligned agendas and what we're trying to move uh, across the world. Um, I don't think I have to tell you all that this is a really special time in development. We haven't had a year like 2015 in a whole generation. Uh, it's the pivotal moment where the Millennium Development Goals, as you know, are going to be reset. They're called the Sustainable Development Goals. They'll come into play in September when the United Nations meet. And what those goals do is give us a blueprint and a roadmap as a world about how to act and act most effectively in development. When you look at what has happened in the last 15 years since the Millennium Development Goals were set, we've done some incredible things as a world. We've halved poverty, we've cut in half childhood deaths, we've almost cut in half maternal deaths. Those were all three big key goals as part of the Millennium Development Goals. Now, it's not just those goals being set. It takes the public will to say, this is important. I want my government to invest our overseas development assistant dollars in those issues, and I believe them. I believe in them. Um, the way that these get translated on the ground, um, clearly the speakers who've already spoken on the panel before me travel a lot, have lived in the developing world, and have been there. I have in my position the great privilege of being out in the developing world. I'm out about four times a year. Not only am I calling on governments and advocating for changes within their own governments, but I spend a lot of time on the ground meeting with men and women in re remote rural villages, uh, in the slums in Nairobi, et cetera. And what I see now in the developing world that I didn't see when we began in this work is that those Millennium Development Goals are being carried all the way down to the most remote rural health posts. So Ethiopia, for instance, has invested in 15,000 health posts, and they've staffed them with 30,000 healthcare workers, predominantly women. A health post is about the size of this stage. It's a tiny little building, but it's a place where a woman comes in to get her child vaccinated, where she comes for her antenatal visits, where she comes in if she's wanting to learn about clean water and sanitation. When I go in those health posts, the healthcare workers hang on the wall and they have them up all the time, not just because I'm there, pieces of paper that show you how many children have died in their village, how many pregnancies are planned and when those women are due, what the vaccination rate is, how many cases of malaria. It is what happens at the global level with, with the uh, Millennium Development Goals and now the Sustainable Development Goals carried all the way down to the village level. And that that linkage is what is allowing us to know where to place those bets, and it's what's creating change. The reason we've had such a steep history in childhood mortality is because we know what works now, and because these health systems are being built out now by the various governments. Rwanda, Sri Lanka, Ethiopia, Senegal's investing in theirs. We can now take all this incredible innovation and run them through those health systems if you get the health system up and running in the right way in the right way. Um, 
Bill and I wrote an annual letter. We do at the beginning of each year. One of the things that we're, the predictions that we're making in the next 15 years is that we think more people, the poor will be better off in the next 15 years than they have ever been in the history of the earth. And that's because we're learning as a community together in partnership about what really works. Besides the sustainable development goals this year, another marker for our own foundation is that we have just crossed our 15-year anniversary. And so it's been a time for Bill and I and the organization to stop and pause and reflect on what we've done, what solutions we think we found and are deploying, and what areas we want to go into that are potentially a bit new for us. We are always looking for every dollar that we put down in these investments for the developing world. Are we getting the return? Are, if we're asking the Swedish government to invest in something like the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations, which they did with us from day one, if we ask them to reinvest, we have to say to ourselves, are we reinvesting because we think that's a good mechanism and we're actually getting vaccines out there? So, when we started our foundation, we had a few key principles in mind. The first is to live our values out through the foundation. And our primary goal with the foundation, our mission, is that Bill and I believe that all lives have equal value. All lives, no matter where they're lived on the planet. And yet the world doesn't today treat all lives as, as equal. The second principle that we had besides our value statement and our mission was that Bill and I both come from a technology background. I'm a computer science major. I worked at Microsoft for my career. And we both believe in the power of innovation to change the world. Look at what's going on with your cell phones today, right? Unbelievable. Ericsson in your own country. Just huge changes. But we believe in innovations, not just technology innovations, but scientific innovations to change the world. So we're very invested today in vaccines and uh, pharmaceuticals and, and biotechnology. The third principle that we have is, as a foundation, we have a lot to learn. This is a gigantic space with a myriad of issues, and we call ourselves a learning organization. And I hope for the history of our foundation, we will always be known as a learning organization. So in 2015, we set out on this journey of really trying to create some equity in the world. And we thought about where could philanthropy play in that space and what we might do. One of the things that I would say we have learned over the years about innovation is it's not just scientific innovation. Where we started in research and development, we will always be in research and development. But we soon learned that we also needed to learn how to deliver those scientific innovations. And we started to learn and are still learning about behavioral change. Because if I can't get a woman, if I take the greatest, latest vaccine to her and she won't accept the polio drops in her child's mouth or the vaccine in the child's arm, nothing's gonna happen with that scientific innovation. Now that we've gotten childhood mortality cut in half, there's still about 6.6 .6 million deaths a year. We have to look at that equation and say, well, where are those 6.6 .6 million deaths? 40% now are in the first month of life. Vaccines aren't going to change that. What will change that? Well, things like getting a woman to immediately and exclusively breastfeed. What's the country that's had the most success in the last five years? Vietnam. They've tripled their immediate and exclusive breastfeeding rate. And you know what they did? They did a really kind of innovative TV advertising campaign where it's a baby telling mothers and dads why it's important to be best fed. Some of the things that they're learning about how to get this behavior change down, we're going to take to other countries. And that's just one of many, many, many examples I could give you. Um, the other thing I want to say about this year for me in particular, speaking from the personal side, uh, is I turned 50 this year. And uh, again, a it was last, late last summer, it was a time for me to pause and reflect. And when I think about what I want to make sure my career stands for for the rest of my life, and when I look back at the end, I want to say that I had a role in empowering women and girls. As we have learned more and more about how to deliver these amazing innovations out in places in these remote rural areas, it has become absolutely clear that women and girls are at the center of that. That at any program that you do, you've got to have women as agents of change. If you invest in a woman and girl, she invests in everybody else in her family. We know that if she gets an extra kroner in her pocket, 
she puts 90% of it back into her family. And she invested in things like health and education. But if we don't look at our programming and figure out how to put women at the very center of it, we will miss so many opportunities and we will make false assumptions about how we're helping her lift her life up. One example that makes me incredibly excited, when I go out and see the mobile phone technology that is so ubiquitous now in Africa, mobile payments are at scale in Kenya, Tanzania, Bangladesh, the Philippines. The difference that makes in a woman's life when she's in a remote rural area and she can save a dollar a day on her phone, or her husband goes into the city, goes into Nairobi and gets a job and sends money back to her on her phone, it means when it's time to pay the school fees or when the hunger season comes, she has money. And she doesn't have to renegotiate with her husband over the finances. She's got money to invest in her kids. That is an absolute game changer. And that is but one example of what we're going to be able to do. It's already being delivered with cell phones, but many, many more innovations to come on cell phones uh, for women. So when I think of women, I don't think of them as recipients of age. Of, of aid. I think that of them as economic engines of change. And when I go these days to the United Nations and sit on these panels, you know, with presidents and prime ministers, they are all talking about women and girls because they know it makes a huge difference to the GDP of their country. So we need to act accordingly. We need to follow our own blueprint on the SDGs. We need to invest, as you all well know, Sweden has been out in the forefront for a long time on women and girls issues, whether it's your new feminist foreign policy that I haven't heard of in any other countries yet, since that's so new here, but even sexual and reproductive health rights. Sweden was out in front on those issues, and we have a chance now of delivering contraceptives to 120 million women by 2020 because investments you all are making, we're making, and other governments are making, both from the donor nations and the low-income countries. So what I want to say to all of you is as we look at this roadmap of the sustainable development goals. We have some milestones coming up. We have the Financing for Development Conference in Addis Ababa that's coming up here in July very soon that will help us finance those sustainable development goals. It's a chance for the climate community and the health community to come together to make investments. But we also need to make sure that the G7 nations live up to their commitments. So this 0.7% of GNI that's going to overseas development assistance, Sweden has led on that. You all are actually give over 1% of your GNI to ODA. We use that to go to other country governments to say that's the right thing to do. You should continue to invest. So keeping the public's voice up on that and saying how important Swedish development aid is, is something that is phenomenally that comes from your country. The last thing I'll say is that our foundation is supporting something that many of you may have heard about, something called Global Citizen. And that's to bring to the populace the idea that we should all be global citizens. We should all be investing on behalf of others in the world. And if we align our efforts and we continue on this learning journey as a very large community, we will lift up hundreds of millions of people around the world. So I want to say that extend, um, ending extreme poverty is within our reach. It's within our lifetime if we finally put women and girls at the center of our agenda. It's thrilling to be able to talk about what's possible in the world, to think about so many people having an equitable life. And so I'd love to see us grab this historic opportunity to make sure that everybody on this planet has a chance to live a healthy and productive life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was very, very inspiring. Um, I must say, and very optimistic and positive in many ways. Not downplaying the challenges, but really seeing that we have the opportunities and you start to see some fundamental changes in terms of government as well. You said you had a learning process, and I should say actually, it's interesting that you bring up this issue of behavioral change uh, as a key factor. And SCI has actually just this year launched 
uh, research program to really try to understand behavioral change and choice because mm. we have the same experience on that. We have to understand what the challenges are for the uptake, for instance, of new technology and, and knowledge. Um, you, you said that you've had a learning experience now after 15 years and you have a lot of success stories. Have you also seen that there were certain things that didn't work out as you anticipated? I'm sure many, but if you can pick on something which really gave you an insight, meaning that we changed a little bit the way we operate. Sure. So early on, we invested in a disease uh, which you may or may not have heard of. It's called Kalazar in, in India. It's a very debilitating disease. And there was a drug available for it, but you had to go in and be in the hospital, get an intravenous tube in your arm and be there for 14 days. So we invested, there was a fantastic company, new piece of technology coming out. We could get the drug down to about six days, which wasn't great, but it was a bit better. And so we invested in, in the science to do that. And we actually made progress. We got the drug. Uh, prices were still expensive. But at the end of the day, we realized we weren't going to solve that problem for two reasons. We hadn't gone upstream enough to get ahead of, okay, how do you get on top of this disease so people don't even get it? We're just treating the downstream of after you've got it, okay, you've got a, a slightly better drug. And we didn't un even understand as a foundation the vector in which the disease was being spread. So I can tell you today, we don't go into a disease area at all anymore without understanding the entire vector of disease, how things are transmitted, how you might stop it, how you go upstream. Uh, we try and relieve pain and suffering today, so we'll often still do a drug, but we're always trying to say, how do you go upstream of the science and prevent whatever the disease is? So that is one of about 10 learnings I could give you, but that's one example. So there's a little bit of a, of a systems approach that we need to have. Would you say that, I mean, you, so you learn from this, but, if, and, but you're also engaged very much in talking to a lot of donors. Are we too risk averse when it comes to investments in the, these particular areas? Are we too afraid? Of, of you know trying out things, learning, and then move forward in general. Well, I wouldn't say that about Sweden. Of but course not. I, I would say that. Well, I mean, I'll give you a specific example where you all weren't afraid, and the rest of the world was. Sexual and reproductive health rights. You all have been out on the forefront talking about that, making sure that women have their rights, uh, keep bringing it to the global agenda. But as a world, we had backed away from contraceptives, and part of it is because of some terrible coercion things that happened around the world in Peru, in my own country, and in India. But as a global health community really because of the terrible political fight in my own country uh, where people had conflated contraceptives with abortion, literally we backed away as a global health community. And so we're hearing from 210 million women that they want access to contraceptives. And we weren't investing in it as a global health community. Sweden was and a few others were, but we weren't stepping out and saying, look, for women and girls, are you kidding me? If a woman has the chance to delay that first birth, particularly if she's a young girl getting married, we know that 15 million girls get married before their first before they're 19, we can delay that first birth and or we can help her space the births, she's more likely to survive and so are her children. The global health community wasn't investing it. Mm. We are now, and you all stayed out in front of that issue, but many, many, many donors backed away. Mm. Uh, just one final question, and then I will ask Ulrike also if you want to sort of make a, a concluding reflection, we can say, from, from this particular part, uh, based also on Melinda's presentation, something, a take home message or, or a comment. Um, we are a science-based organization. We have colleagues also from similar science-based organizations. The role of science in all this, um, sometimes they say, we have enough science, we just need action, come on, there's too much talk and you're too slow and too many papers. Um, <laughs> I didn't say that. You didn't, don't tweet, don't, 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 uh. don't tweet that. <laughs> But if we are coming as a science-based organization to you in the next 15 years um, and really are seeking your support for what we are trying to do, what will be important for us to understand uh, in terms of getting your support? What is important <laughs> in terms of the role of science? Some insights. No. <laughs> Let me just talk about the, the importance of science. It's yeah. fundamental. I mean, we don't yet have a cure for HIV AIDS. 
We don't have a vaccine. We have a terrible vaccine, an old vaccine for tuberculosis that we don't even understand why it works, but it's not very efficacious. We don't have a vaccine for malaria. Those are all, so we're distributing, thank gosh, the tools we have, which are malarial bed nets and, and using behavior science to try and get people to sleep under them. But unless you go upstream on those problems, you'll never solve them. So science is just fundamental to all this, mm -hmm. which is why we do things like the grand challenges that have funded a few of these yeah. projects, because we believe in science. Excellent. Oh, tweet that. <laughs>